You're listening to The Edge with Mark Thompson. Hi, this is Mark. Thank you for being here. This episode features a visit with the Cousteaus. Yes, it is the grandson of Jacques Cousteau, who himself now is an underwater explorer. And he has a new television show which features both him and his wife, who is also an undersea explorer, searching famous shipwrecks and areas of the ocean that might have buried treasure beneath. I know it seems wild, but it's a beautiful show. First of all, it's on Travel Channel. And then what the Cousteaus encounter is really interesting. We'll feature them in the second part of the show. We'll start with Michael Shore in the Fast 15, politics and more. We had our conversation with Michael before the North Korean nuclear test. The most recent one has prompted a lot of reaction. Australia saying that North Korea has to pay a significant price. The South Koreans are actually saying they're trying to ignore the saber rattling from Washington. Donald Trump has suggested there will be a massive military response to the nuclear threat that North Korea poses. Clearly, that is an issue that will come back around. By the way, just on the North Korea thing, you know, we did another show on the U.S. sort of backing into a nuclear confrontation or backing into a war footing. And we had that conversation with Dan Carlin, who's the host of a podcast called Hardcore History. If you go back in the series of podcasts that we've done, you'll find that under Hardcore History or Dan Carlin. Just go back and you'll find it at our website, edge-show.com, or you can just look back in iTunes or Stitcher, wherever you're listening to our show, and you will find it. It kind of gives you a window on how easy it is to back into these confrontations. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you for supporting the show by subscribing on iTunes and on Stitcher with five-star reviews. All the different ways you support us. If you go to our website, edge-show.com, you click on an episode and there'll be an Amazon banner there. If you go to Amazon through our link, we get a little piece of whatever you spend. And I remind you, that's a great way to support our show. Yes, some of you send us money through PayPal. Thank you. It helps us keep the lights on here and all monies, every dime stays with this podcast and goes to webmasters and producers to keep this show running. All right, so it'll be the Fast 15 with Michael Shore and then Undersea Treasure with the Cousteaus. Let's get it going. This is the edge. The advantage, it means. Hey, look, I just spit on me for no reason. That's horrible. Is there some comfort in uncertainty, do you think? You're a degenerate. Because Australian Shepherds need action. Wow. Yeah. This is the edge. That's a self-loathing term that I use. For oh, got it. edge-show.com. This is The Edge. Ladies and gentlemen, he is here. It is politics and more. It is the Fast 15. We welcome Michael Shore. Yes! Ah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. It's been a little while. Thank Come you. Come on. Well, Good okay. to see everyone. That's enough. That's enough. That's not, I don't want him to get too... No, you know, I mean, I, it, it fills me up, though, Mark. Right. We love having you here, and I want to start... Like, we usually start with Trump and... And don't get me wrong, there's a lot going on with the president and with Harvey, and, and you know, we're a nation with, with a lot of pressures right now. Right. But I want to start with the decision that was made by the Los Angeles City Council to do away with calling Columbus Day Columbus Day and call it Indigenous Peoples Day. Right. LA is not the first city to do this. California not the first state to see it happen. It's in Alaska. It's in other places. Vermont has it. It's basically, you know, in the early 2000s, some history that was written in the early 1500s was discovered, disseminated, talked about what Columbus had done when coming to the New World and how he treated the indigenous people here, which was horribly. There was a lot of disease. Some people said that they spread disease intentionally. It's hard to know if that's the case or if they were sophisticated enough to do that. But certainly there was disease and there was just marauding and pillaging and killing uh, so as to be able to settle this for the Spanish crown. And, and I, let me just say one thing yeah. before you move on from that. When you hear that something was colonized, right. that means that a lot of people were slaughtered. Generally speaking, yeah, yeah, that's right. Unless it's, you know, a small island and uh, uh, there weren't very many people there. And, and they did enslave the indigenous people. I mean, it was not... Right, uh, well, it, that's the further. Okay, right. sorry, They're, go ahead. No, 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 That you're right. I mean, that, no. that's it. They enslaved, so you don't have to say much more than that. These people became slaved, and it was forced labor, and... In any case, Columbus Day was put in about 80 years ago during Franklin, De exactly 80 years ago during Franklin Delano Roosevelt's term. And it was because the Knights of Columbus, a charitable and influential Italian-American group, persuaded Roosevelt to do that, to honor the, the, the man who credited with discovering, you know, even if controversially credited with discovering America. So they did it. And it was a day to honor Italian-Americans. And 
and that's fine. And Italian Americans and their contribution at a time when they weren't being honored and certainly should be. But there's no other ethnic group that gets an official federal recognition of their group. Martin Luther King Day is not African. It's all of our day. We all are part of Martin Luther King Day. It's for a person. It's to recognize a great civil rights leader. Exactly. It's to recognize presidents we have. We have Memorial Day. We have Veterans Day. We have Labor Day to recognize the labor movement. And even President's Day is really the combination of those. It it used to be two different days, Lincoln's birthday and Washington's birthday, and they merged it into President's Day. Exactly. And so the idea that Italian-Americans, great as they may be, should be the only people recognized in America or and honored with a federal holiday, that's another part of this. So as time went on, it became about Christopher Columbus and not about Italian Americans because there's not this strong identity with Italian Americans with Columbus Day, right? It just it, it, it started to wane, which is understandable. Not to say that there aren't people that still hold on to it. Italian Americans very active on Columbus Day in their charities and communities. But Americans by and large think of it as Columbus Day. They don't think of the Italian Americans being honored. However, the people that he came and obliterated in some, to some degree don't have any honor to them, and it was their land at that point. So taking this away, probably a good idea. It, it, it lifts up another people. It doesn't hurt anybody but Columbus. As a matter of fact, when Los Angeles voted on it, they're also going to have an Italian-American day here in, this, in Los Angeles. So it's not like that. they're just taking the name Columbus Day away. I love the idea of celebrating different ethnicities. One of the great things about this planet is all the different right. ethnicities and peoples and heritages and traditions. Right. It's all cool, you know? But- no, no, for sure. But we don't have, like, Polish Day. We don't have German Day. We don't have—you know, there are parades in various cities. I'm sure, I'm sure like, Steuben Day in, in Milwaukee is pretty cool, you know? But that's local. That's not a federal holiday. And this, by the way, doesn't do anything to the federal holiday. This is the beginning of also perhaps putting the the truth on Columbus because Columbus is played out in in history books that we learn in school and you know 1492 Columbus sailed the ocean blue and you know he he was a almost like Captain Kirk in Star Trek you know right. I'm mean, going well by the way there was something about him that was that too right I mean he was a brave guy a poor guy somebody who was able to amass all of this ability to explore to go to the the royal family in Spain get sponsored to do that. But he wasn't exploring because he just loved exploration. It was about sacking riches. It was about bringing home treasure. Well, it, and that, and right. you could say, well, that's not the only way he's going to get sponsors, Mark. I mean, you know, he's not going to get... Yeah, well, I, I'm suggesting maybe that that was a priority for him but as these, well. It was the age of discovery. So this was, this was you know, the he, trying to disprove the flat earth to people as well. I mean, there was, there was all sorts of... First of all, neither of us know because w- w- there aren't great records of it then, but there are some records. It, it seemed like they was a little bit of entrepreneurship, conquering, and conquering brings with it its own baggage, and adventure. I mean, it was all of those things. So yeah, I- and by the way, the flat earth thing, I'm pretty sure that Columbus was not alone in, I mean, the flat earth was beginning right. to be disproved by a lot of people. No, I know, but I, I think when I you're think the guy who goes to the, so if getting. you go to the Queen of Spain and they say yes, you're the guy who gets credit with it. That's what, that's what happens. I mean, you could, you could have 10,000 people could have an idea for the windshield wiper, right? But the guy who gets the windshield wiper, Tucker gets the, the patent and there he goes. So I, I want to also say that he was, he was an incredible guy, Columbus, from what we know, but he was also a really bad guy in many ways. And that was part of the time and part of the way that these things were happening all over the world, not a defense of it. But there's no need to honor him. You can honor Italian Americans. You can honor immigrants. I mean, that's what this is. But but maybe the people that were here should get some recognition. And it's not, that's not on, that's all it is is on the books now. And it was a 14 to 1 vote. Just one city council member in Los Angeles, Joe Boscaino, who represents, who's Italian himself and represents an Italian contingency, I voted against it. I love that you said he was a great guy, but he was also a horrible guy or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, he was, yeah, he was a, he, an accomplished guy, but a horrible guy. A horrible guy. Because I think that really is what we deal with with a lot of the people who have been part of historical events. For right? sure, yeah. And we're wrestling with that right now as a nation with yeah. these Civil War statues and all the rest. No, and people are t- they're talking in New York City, taking down the Columbus statue at Columbus Circle. But now instead, it seems like they're going to agree to put a marker there talking about some of the real history. But they've vandalized 
Columbus statues around the country. There's one here in Los Angeles in Grand Park, a big statue. And I think this is the beginning of the dismantling of that. And revisiting history is important, right? I mean, the more you learn as time goes on, it can inform different parts of what, you know, of and, and also new groups become offended as, as we're learning in Charlottesville, Virginia and throughout the South. You know, there's a quote, and it's from W.E.B. Du Bois, and it is, one is astonished in the study of history at the recurrence of the idea that evil must be forgotten, distorted, skimmed over. We must not remember that Daniel Webster got drunk, but only remember that he was a splendid constitutional lawyer. We must forget that George Washington was a slave owner and simply remember the things we regard as creditable and inspiring. The difficulty, of course, with this philosophy is that history loses its value as an incentive and example. It paints perfect men and noble nations, but it does not tell the truth. Yeah, what a beautiful quote. I and mean, that's, that's so, so on the mark. I, but I think it's also part of human nature. I, in you know, missing my late father, who I think of every day repeatedly, I think of him as this amazing, perfect guy. I miss the great dad, right? But there were, my dad was crazily flawed. And, and I had real issues with my father, too. But I put those aside because my history is my great dad. So I, we must do that collectively, too, in some ways. Now, right now as we talk, the country is dealing with a huge emergency, unprecedented emergency, really, in Texas and Louisiana. I say unprecedented. You could say, well, Katrina was uh, unprecedented. Yeah. And, and that's true when you start talking about the scope and the urgency and, and, and the I think human also, toll. I think also the disproportionate way in which it struck poor Americans versus this was, this seemed to be a more equitable storm, um, if that's a fair way to say it. And when I say unprecedented, I'm talking about really from a weather perspective, right. uh, which is a weird way to... We but, talk you know, about everything from a weather perspective. You have to grade these things. And this is unprecedented rainfall. This is the most rain. So I, I heard this thing, and I don't know if it's accurate, Mark, but I heard this thing that, that Seattle had record rainfall last year in 2016 and they got 49 inches and that was a record for them and texas got 54 in three days or something right you know? right i don't know if that's true or not but it just put it, to me it is really what put it all in perspective now to the political part right because you have a party in control, the GOP, that is all about government's bad, get government out of things, we should privatize everything, and right. I wish we had time regularly to visit some of these things, and we will in future weeks. But now you're facing a situation where go everybody looks to government for help. Yeah. And where does this put this party of anti-government, first of all? Yeah. And, and then what is likely to happen? Well, it's hard to say where it puts it, because they. I'm not being judgmental here, but of the two parties on this sort of thing, they are the more hypocritical. A lot of Republicans fought aid for Hurricane Sandy, and we're talking about things that have been talked about in this recent news cycle a and lot. And just because you said that, let me just jump in and say uh, those Republicans like Ted Cruz say, well, that's because it was filled with pork. The truth right. is not necessarily that, is it? No, it's not. A lot of Republican bills and a lot of Democratic aid bills have in the past been, been attached to other bills. It's sometimes an easier way of getting them through. It's also a tactical way of saying, hey, if we attach these things to an aid bill, we get some of the things we want. And so, you know, Cruz isn't entirely wrong there, but they don't have to be included that way, right? And that's what these senators end up having to do or trying to do. Mike Pence, when he was in Congress, he was a congressman during Katrina, and um, he refused to vote for a Katrina aid bill because he wanted to make sure that tax cuts were also a part of it. Uh, which of course make no sense because you're spending more money, but we don't want to tax. We don't we, we don't want to tax uh, more and, and or or spending bills. I shouldn't say tax cuts. I think it was more that he didn't he wanted to lower spending bills, which makes more sense. But that's how these people work, and that's how Congress works. But the hypocrisy on this, and it's not just about spending, and it's not just it's about being reliant upon the government. It's about the fact that hey, let's go into the EPA and just slash and burn the EPA. Let's get people out of offices. Let's close the jobs. Let's shrink that department. And then what happens? That area of Texas is known colloquially as the chemical coast, right? So right now, the EPA has to be more manned than they've ever been to make sure that they are able to remediate all of the damage that was done by toxic chemicals, because there are a ton of them. There are 15 Superfund sites, and Superfund sites are sites that the government has identified that need cleanup over a long period of time, and they've put money into them. 15 just along that Texas coast right there. And you're going to say to me, the EPA charged with cleaning this stuff up 
overseeing the cleanup of it. They're going to pull people out of there. That's what they've done. So we're not ready for it. And that's the shrinking of government. If government is there, and this is a liberal thing, but government is there to take care of the people, right? Well, if they don't, and they're there to take care of the corporations, they're not even doing that right now. So Republicans are going to have to come with their tail between their legs to ask for money. And that's what they're doing. By the way, when we say Republicans GOP, I understand there are people listening who are Republicans in GOP. And you don't all speak with one voice. And we understand that. We're I'm, really talking talk- about, I'm talking about Congress. Exactly. Yeah. And th- I want to make that clear. We're talking about those who are governing as GOP. Right. Okay, that's all we're talking about. But a lot of accommodations were made to those companies that you're talking about, chemical companies and oil companies down in the Texas area. I mean, virtually do whatever you want policy on. Right. They steamrolled a lot of environmental policy. They got them out of the way. I mean, and this is... And that's also the state of Texas, by the way. It's not just the federal government because Texas has some purview. You see the effects of it because a lot of the safeguards that would have been in place, and by the way, that were lobbied to be put in place by environmentalists are not there. I make the point because when you talk about corporate citizenship, the corporate entities that are there in Texas haven't been good citizens, as we've seen. They've taken every advantage, and they're taking it for bottom lines. They've been good citizens if you're a stockholder, right. but they haven't been good citizens if you if you live there or need the water and land in that area the and the air. The only thing that I disagree with is they've taken advantage. They haven't because there's nothing of, for which to take advantage. There are so few restrictions there. They don't even have to take advantage. They can just go on. That's business as usual for them. So it's not like they're even nefariously doing it. They're just doing it in many cases. They don't self-police is what I'm no, trying to say. No, they don't at all. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And so when you say, oh, Mark, these government restrictions, they're, they're bad for business, I get it. They're protections for the people. They're protections for the area around that chemical plant. Yeah. And without them, we see the result. Right. And so, I, I, again, just to finish it, there's a way of doing it that they're going to have to discover is the right way to do it in Congress. And I think that they got a little better of, about it in the wake of Sandy. And I think that, um, but but I do know that the Republicans in this case in Congress are the ones that are on this issue, the most hypocritical, whether or not they have to answer for it because of gerrymandering, because of the way that, that Congress is built, they can still probably go about it in the same way. Uh, Joel Osteen's church is open, Michael. You may want to. Uh, yeah, no, no. I uh, I tried. To, I tried to, to get that. in a week ago. Yeah, couldn't. But now everything seems to work. No, I guess there was a muddied, maybe muddied is the wrong word, but a uh, an uh, uncertain uh, spin to that story. But I think that you know when I heard him saying, "Well, I didn't want to endanger people," and when the water is rising and people are in danger wherever they are, the, the fact that there may be some moisture in the church isn't going to dissuade people. If you have a space for five thousand and you're a church. That's when churches do their best work. I liked that they had to go downstairs to the subterranean parking area to find the Old water, water yeah. for those pictures. Right. Uh, to me, he was guilty as sin. Yeah, pun, me too. I, pun intended. Saying, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying that I, I have since then heard other people say otherwise, but that's probably his machine working to make it seem that way. Yeah. Meanwhile, you heard great stories like that guy from who runs the mattress and store. Oh, God. What opens a great his story. Place. And David Begnon on, C- on CBS did a great piece on that. Did you see the video of the guy playing piano? At, his, at the store? At his house. No, the guy oh. got back to his house and it was a, devastated. Water up to his, you know, his, his waist. And he sat down in this water at his piano bench. And the piano itself was just above, the, the, the keyboard was just above the water line or maybe like six inches above. The, and he videoed, that, or he and somebody videoed him just sitting playing the piano in his flooded house. It was just the most amazing thing. Wow. It was so moving. So I have to find that. Yeah, find it. Find it. Maybe we'll have a link to that on our website, edge-show.com. And if you go there and you don't see it, you'll know that we forgot to put the link in there. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's probably why. I mean, you we should have, be able to figure that out, though. You know, we're barely paying our webmaster enough to kind of get the show on the air to begin with. Right. So something extra like, hey, can, can you put this link up? Sometimes it doesn't matter. Right. Well, you should talk to staff. I mean, they do a great job filling this place with an no, audience every week. They could do crowd. that, yeah. Is that headline that we saw about the Congress, actually about Congress considering removing relief money to produce a tax bill 
You saw that. I did. I don't know. It's too early. Congress is out. The leadership hasn't really spoken about it. People report on it. It's not the best time of year to report on Congress just because it's very difficult to get information. The tax reform bill that's going to be looked at is nothing but a tax cut. It's not the ta- Calling it tax reform is the biggest misnomer in politics right now. This Congress is going to come back from this August recess with so much to deal with. Not just Harvey. They're going to have to deal with tax reform. They're going to have to deal with infrastructure. A lot of it happened while Congress was out. And their hands are going to be pretty full. To say that they're going to have to prioritize some things and and not others, and as well as dealing with some of the revelations on Russia, you have oversight commissions, intelligence commissions dealing with that. Their hands are pretty full. So it's hard to say exactly what's going to happen when you haven't heard from the leadership. What's happening with this Russia investigation with the new email revelation on Comey that has suggested that perhaps it's all been piled on obstruction of justice, you know. Right. I'm talking about in the dialogue, in the discussion. Yeah, I mean, I talked to a Democratic senator earlier this week, and he said to me that his Republican colleagues, everybody's just waiting for Mueller. They're just kind of, there's no reason to jump on now because you don't have anything to hang on to. For Democrats to say impeach, impeach, he said, it's great that some are saying it because most believe it, that there should be impeachment, most Democrats, he's saying. But Republicans are going to get anywhere on it until Mueller presents them with something to be upset about. And the rumors and the articles, they give comments, they say this, they say that, but until there's hard evidence presented to Congress by Robert Mueller and his group, nothing's really going to happen. That's one senator saying it, but it makes sense, too. And we've talked before on the show, and we did a whole, we, we did part of a whole show about yeah. impeachment, and it's just a political thing. And this Congress seems sort of duty-bound to keep this guy in office. I mean, That's others... the thing. They don't have it. What, what, what the senator was saying to me was there's nothing yet. To hang an impeachment on. Yeah. You've got you to gotta have something. Or even if it's not an impeachment, to break from the president. If you break from the president because he's a crazy guy, well, we knew that before he was elected. If Robert Mueller finds out that Donald Trump, uh, you know, uh, let's say, uh, knew that the Russians were controlling the election. I mean, that's not what's going to happen. But let's just say that. Then, if you're a Republican senator, you can say, all right, I don't think you should be impeached for this, but I'm not going to support him anymore. He's not going to have my votes. He's not going to... Then you'll have some people talking about impeachment. But if there's nothing yet that's concrete and investigated by more than just a journalist, uh, and I shouldn't say just a journalist, in addition to the journalists, then there's nothing to do yet. You know, Donald Trump talks a lot about the media, and you hear a lot about the failing New York Times, the failing Washington Post. But the truth is, the subscriptions are... Never been better. Yeah. No. I mean, everything's on an uptick. Extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, local papers, the big national papers, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the, the Washington Post for sure. So he's, in a way, been the best thing to happen because, you know, when something's being taken away from you is when you need to protect it most, and people in an encouraging way or realizing that, whoa, whoa we got to we gotta protect it. At the same time, there are things being done when government releases the restrictions, for example, on television station ownership, and yeah. you end up with a Sinclair broadcasting right. kind of dominance. They are the clearly right-wing ownership right. that has taken hold of more television stations. They have more coverage nationally than and any this other this predates owner. Donald Trump, by the way. I mean, That's this is, right. It's been going on for a long time, and... Uh, no, but, I think I think very much predates yeah, Donald yeah, yeah. Trump. Uh, so I don't think I I don't think it has a correlation the same way that the spike in newspaper ship newspaper uh, subscriptions. I does. see. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. that's all I mean. But yeah, no, it's it's really disconcerting. It's also underreported. Oh, I don't hear it talked about yeah. at all. Which Probably is why be- you have to listen to the Edge. Probably because those television stations are owned by Sinclair. Why would they cover it? Why bother covering it? Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Who's going to cover it? You are kind of a fan favorite, Michael Shore. I appreciate that. I, I don't. I'd Anybody need, have I'd any need questions proof. for Michael? Send them in. You are at Michael Shore. I'm at Michael Shore. And Shore and is spelled S-H-U-R-E. Like the microphone. And this is and has been the Fast 15 with Michael Shore, everybody. Oh, thank you all. Thank you all. Wow. Oh, you're great. You're all hey, great. Michael. Thank you, guys. If you enjoy listening to The Edge, support them by subscribing to The Edge on iTunes, Stitcher, and you can listen through the iHeartRadio app. Get busy listening. Edge-show.com. Through the magic of a telephone line, we're joined by Ashlyn and Philippe Cousteau. 
You know the name Cousteau because Philippe is part of that legendary Cousteau family. He is the grandson of Jacques Cousteau and has picked up where the granddad left off a bit. Welcome, Philippe and Ashlyn Cousteau. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having us. First of all, Ashlyn, you guys are married, right, Philippe and Ashlyn? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Were you uh, an adventurer before you met Philippe? Yeah, actually. Well, I should say I was always a water baby. I think I, was, I became a lifeguard when I was 15, but I really went down the road of journalism. So I went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, I studied journalism, and when I graduated, I, I went that route. So for seven years, I was a correspondent for E! News. One of the reasons I wanted to work at E! was because I loved that show Wild On back in the day. Do you guys remember that? With sure, where she sure. travels the world. She's been on the show before. She traveled the world on that yeah, show. exactly. So that was the whole reason I wanted to work at E! Um, I worked there for seven years. It was great. But I met Philippe, and I just kind of had that realization that I wanted my life to be a little bit more than just talking about Justin Bieber and the Kardashians. <laughs> wow, it took you seven years to come up with that realization? <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm not <laughs> Well, because the Oscars really are fun. <laughs> you know, so, I, I realized that, that I wanted to, to do something more, but I saw the power that pop culture has over the general public. And I thought, you know, if we can, you know, if we can make people famous for doing absolutely nothing, then we have to be able to make saving the world cool. And Philippe and I had, had met, we fell in love, and then we really just started brainstorming on how we could work together and how we could, you know, harness the power of entertainment to literally save the world. Did you meet at some red carpet opening at a premier glamorous Hollywood thing? <laughs> Philippe was giving a speech about the Beefly oil spill here in Los Angeles at the Four Seasons, and I went to go hear him, and as soon as our eyes met, we are we are both giant people also. Uh, Philippe is 6'4", I'm 5'11", flat foot, and I think I was wearing three-inch heels that night, so I was almost as height. So literally our eyes met because we're the same height, and we fell in love, and that was it. Oh, that's terrific. And then you, and you met at a cool thing, too. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Now, for those who are, are younger boys and girls, I mean, explain, Philippe, your grandfather really was the first of his kind in terms of bringing the ocean to our living rooms, you know, bringing us a window on a whole world. Well, you know, yeah, it, Ted Turner, I think, described it best when he called my grandfather the father of the modern environmental movement. And he was an icon and a, and a legendary figure in the, in the last half of the 20th century, uh, not only because of the documentaries that he made and, and the work that he did as a, as a conservation and an ocean advocate, but also because what a lot of people forget, particularly younger people, that you know, prior to the 1940s, the only things we really knew about the ocean was the trash that we poured into it and the fish that we pulled out of it. And it wasn't until my grandfather co-invented the aqualung in the 1940s with an engineer named Emile Gagnon in the south of France that human beings were able to scuba dive. Prior to that, it was clomping around with big lead boots and a hose to the surface and the big hard helmets at the bottom of the, of the ocean. And that was really something that was reserved for Navy salvage. And then the only other people really were pearl divers or oyster divers who really did any kind of free diving and swimming in the ocean with masks and snorkel and things like that. So Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's a huge thing. Your grandfather, Jacques Cousteau, who, as I say, is a legend. He was also an inventor to the point that he collaborated in this invention that's used today to dive. What do you call it? Scuba diving, right? Scuba diving, yeah, absolutely. He, he was the co-inventor of, of such a scuba diving, which is the first time people were able to swim freely and explore the ocean. And on top of that, he invented underwater cameras because they didn't exist. Um, he worked with you know countless engineers and, and people to be able to tell the story of what he saw underwater. He was a storyteller first and foremost, a problem solver, and he did absolutely change uh, change the world. There's no question about that. I had no idea. Josh, did you know that? I did, in fact, know that he was. Yeah, uh, he well, made, I feel he made a little bit, thing. <laughs> I'm a little feel like a little bit. Oh, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but because I knew that he was involved in those. They call them submersibles. Is that it? The the subs. Oh, that, yep. Yeah. Yep. He worked on some of the first of those that were that were invented in order to, uh, to be able to dive and, and dive deeper than human beings can go. And yeah, he was a pioneer all around on, on so much of that technology in the, the those decades, the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, a huge period of time that he was such a, a force opening our eyes for the first time to, to the oceans and, and so many things. They went to Antarctica, they went to the Arctic all over the world. They were some of the first nature documentaries. That's exactly right. I just remember as a kid thinking, wow, this is unreal. This guy is a, a true adventure. 
adventurer and seems to have sort of a respect for the environment that he operates in. And and growing up, I, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and it's like you would go, name a famous scuba diver, and you go, Jacques Cousteau. Okay, name a second one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Philippe, your dad also was someone who did a lot in the ocean and, had, and was also an explorer. He was indeed. Uh, he was really my grandfather's right hand uh, for, for so many years. He directed and filmed 26 of those Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau films that so many people are familiar with. He had his own series of Oasis in Space and was, I think, really only a second to my grandfather in, in terms of, at the time, uh, his notoriety and fame in, in conservation and sustainability. Unfortunately, he died in a plane accident in 1979, and so that well, obviously ended his career, but I think it's one of the reasons that a lot of people don't necessarily remember the contribution that he made is because he died so many years ago. You know, I want to get to the TV show and the magic that you bring to it because it's a beautiful show, but just because you mentioned your dad, his death was... As you say, he was a young man when he died. How old was he? He was two years older than I am now. He was 39, and I was born six months later. Exactly. Wow. So so you never really knew him. No, I didn't, though I do consider myself fortunate to a degree because, you know, a lot of people lose a parent or sometimes both parents, and they have photographs, maybe a letter. I was fortunate enough to have movies and books and documentaries and so many things that he left behind that represented his work and and his vision for the world. So in that sense, I I think I was fortunate, or perhaps as fortunate as one could be in in the face of such an awful tragedy that certainly still haunts, I know, my mother, my sister, and myself today, but it's something that uh, I still look on the bright side and and am proud that that he left behind such a body of work. Oh, yeah. I mean, the legacy of your family is remarkable, and you're continuing with it. Did your desire to be part of this undersea world of the Cousteaus, did that come naturally? I mean, really, you can be honest with us. Were you sort of drawn to that, or would you rather have been like a pro soccer player? or something (laughs) well you know when i was very little i wanted to be a fireman but what little boy doesn't want to be a fireman or a policeman or something like that yeah we'll give you a pass on that (laughs) (laughs) so that was that was something i always wanted to do when i was little as i grew up though you know growing up with the stories of my grandfather he passed away when i was uh, 17 and um you know being able to grow up with the films of my father and uh, his books and his work and the stories that my mother, who spent 13 years on expedition with him, were telling me, or was telling me, it became a, a no-brainer. I mean, to be able to explore the world and travel and in such a way that you can share it with the world and work to inspire others to explore and make the world a better place is the best job I can think of. And did you spend time aboard the Calypso as a kid? Not really. I'd been aboard once or twice uh, when I was little, but by the time I was really old enough to do the kind of work and go on expedition. My grandfather was pretty old and, and wasn't really doing that kind of work. He was more of an elder statesman at that time. And, and so, no, I, I missed, not, no pun intended, or perhaps pun intended, uh, I missed the boat on that one. Gotcha. <laughs> the uh, conservationist side of your grandfather, and I associate your family and your name with conservation, you've continued with that? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, essential to everything that I do and everything that we do. Uh, you know, it's, it, my, my father and grandfather were both storytellers, and they were amazing storytellers, and they believed in the power of story to change the world. Uh, and after all, since the beginning of, of human time on this planet, story is the language of learning. And, you know, when my grandfather first started out, there, was, there wasn't a con- really a concept of ocean conservation. Uh, of course, there was a history of conservation on land. You know, his contemporary, Rachel Carson, uh, all the way back to, of course, Teddy Roosevelt and Henry David Thoreau and and people like that. But the oceans were seen as this endless kind of pit, this endless resource that was inexhaustible. And he was really, in the beginning, all about exploration. He didn't have a notion of conservation either. He wanted to go out and explore this place and see it. And what he was at the front seat of was witnessing the terrible destruction of the environment, particularly the ocean, post-World War II. And as we saw industrialization explode across the developed world, uh, Europe and the United States in particular, he was there uh, watching, filming over the course of the 40s and 50s and 60s, the precipitous decline of the health of those systems. I mean, today the, the, the Mediterranean is essentially a dead sea. And so he, he saw that. And it was in the 60s that he really began to change along with my father. And they began to realize, wow, uh, these these the fish are disappearing, the corals, not everything's changing so rapidly that he really turned a corner and, and really became an ardent environmental advocate 
um, because he saw the change with his own eyes. And so picking up from that, everything we do, we started out with a nonprofit, Earth Echo International. We've grown that to be one of the leading environmental education groups in the, in the country. Um, that was where I started out in education and conservation. Then uh, all the documentaries and films from CNN to, awesome, to Animal Planet to, to Discovery Channel have always had an element of exploration, conservation, uh, science to them. Uh, I host a syndicated series right now called Awesome Planet. It's been our fourth season premieres on September 9th. You know, it's all about natural history and how the world works, and that's syndicated uh, mostly on Fox stations across the country. And then, of course, Kirby Pirate Treasure and the books that we do and all the different things, working on virtual reality, all of it is really designed to get people excited about the world and get them exploring and, and help protect it. It's an interesting take you have on it because you are upbeat. I hear it in you. And, you know, Ashlyn, you you have that same exuberance. You get us into it. And then when you communicate something like you threw away the fact that the Mediterranean is essentially a dead sea or that we've so much of this great resource has been destroyed through industrialization and you at least come at it in a way that has an emotion and a passion and exuberance. So I kind of feel like, oh, well, okay, what do we do? And I get that from you. And I feel as though that is a decent way to communicate it. need to come at these problems from all different sides. There are some people, there's many people that will sit down and watch a two-hour documentary about the world ending. There are many people that won't watch that documentary, um, but maybe they'll read a book or maybe they'll sit down and watch an adventure slash travel show and they realize that as they're watching the show, they're actually learning things and they're exploring things and they I think when we come at it not in the doom and gloom type of way, which works in some cases, um, but most of what we do is how can we be positive, put a positive spin, you know, look at these huge issues in a, in a different light and really get people excited and then hopefully motivated because, you know, the movement, I will say, the environmental movement has been putting out, you know, documentaries that are explaining the things that are going to happen to our climate and to our planet. And a lot of people haven't been paying attention. They haven't reached, you know, the, the general population, the, the, the mass group of people they need to. That's why Philippe and I kind of come at these projects in a way, okay, well, let's think of something that's entertaining to everyone and use that as a way to teach people things, but not a shove it down their throat kind of way, just in a way that's fun, exciting, and then hopefully afterwards they will want to ask questions and they will want to get involved. Yeah, it's funny, in the first episode of Caribbean yeah. Pirate Treasure, there is essentially a mystery being unraveled about this pirate like he was a super pirate i guess i I had no idea this guy even existed but he was unbelievable he was like i gotta think he was like a hall of fame pirate right (laughs) i was 16 years with john hamlin 16 years most pirates were lucky if they got two years and weren't killed or captured or captured and then killed he did 16 years of pillaging all around the world in a wooden ship And he escaped authorities, and they still don't really know what happened to him. They think he went down to South America with some treasure and just lived out a happy life. And and he was wanted by everybody because the— Oh, yeah. And the British, the Portuguese. Well, and that's the thing. It's it's ironic that most of the pirates we've heard of, we've heard of them because they were captured. Yep. So they weren't necessarily good pirates. Uh, Blackbeard, Calico Jack, these kinds of legends were certainly effective in their day, but usually that only lasted a few years. And as, as we said in the show, Sean Hamlin is the, probably the greatest pirate that no one's ever heard of because he flew under the radar. He was so successful and he disappeared, as they say, probably down to Brazil, uncaptured with untold riches. And so it's, it's one of those things, just a terrific fun show because, as Ashlyn said, it, it's all about an adventure. And, and sometimes... Uh, you know, today, it's hard to reach people, and, and you have to create different types of media and content that reaches different types of audiences. And so, be it a children's book, be it a syndicated morning show on a Saturday morning that kids and families love, to a show like Caribbean Pirate Treasure, to things with CNN, we have to really, I think, to, to continue that sense and that legacy, we really have to, to run the gauntlet of, of different uh, outlets and, and types of story to tell to engage different audiences. Yeah. Caribbean Pirate Treasure is a show that airs on the Travel Network, and I watched it on Amazon, too. You can watch it on Amazon. Oh, good. I don't even think we knew that. Yeah, but... <laughs> Thanks, but Mark. but it, un- it uncovers a secret society, kind of. Also, I didn't realize there's a sort of elite group of these treasure hunter superheroes that you guys became at least connected to. They were a little guarded about what they told you, but they did take you on an adventure. It's true. I mean, you have to think, um, you know, with a show like this, 
specifically, like Philippe and I don't exactly know to st- what where to start digging. There is no map with X marks the spot on it, sadly. Um, so we still have our Goonie, our, our Goonie movie um, wishes in our heads, I guess. Yeah, yeah. We um, all grew up with the Goonies back yes. in the eighties. <laughs> you know, so we really are looking for local people, but they have to trust us. Because if we are indeed going to help them try to look for John Hamlin's treasure, which could be worth $150 million, then they have to trust us. And I will say a lot of times it is Philippe's legacy and people's respect for Jacques and Philippe Sr. that really kind of opened the door for us. And they know that if we tell them we're not going to reveal their location, we're not going to reveal it. But they also know that we're doing everything on the up and up. That was always really important to Philippe and I. Because, you know, there are treasure hunters that are respectful to history, and there are treasure hunters that are not. And just go in and find these wrecked ships and just take everything that they can and sell it online. So we make sure that everywhere we go, we have the right permits. We have the, you know, the right permission of the government. And either, it's, you know, it's whatever they want. If they want us to leave it where we found it or if they want us to, you know, bring it back to the government and give it to them. Uh, we follow those rules, but you know this is this is this is history that every single person in the world owns. This is history that that isn't doesn't belong to me or doesn't belong to Philippe or to this you know person that we're out in the field with. It's it's everybody's history, and we want to respect that. Well, what I love about it too, a lot of people think of my grandfather as we sp- discussed earlier, Mark, that that he's a legendary environmental advocate and, and explorer, and he was all those things. But he started out exploring wrecks and, and, and stories of Greek and, and Roman pirates in the Mediterranean in his early days. I didn't know that. So he was something of, a, of an adventurer, treasure hunter himself. Yeah. I, you know, and, and his definition, he had the same approach. You know, they would go and, and in one case, uh, and it's actually in the silent world, the, the feature film that he did uh, that won the, uh, the, the Oscar in the, in the 40s, he talked about going down on these wrecks and pulling up hundreds of these uh, amphoras, these big kind of teardrop-shaped earthenware jars. jars, you could call them. And some of them were still sealed with wax seals and still had wine in them that was 2,000 years old. And wow. while they did open one of those bottles, the rest of all of the things they pulled up and antiquities and stuff all went to museums. Mm-hmm. And as Ashton said, that was really important for us. And he also, you know, in 1968, he went looking for the Concepcion, one of the most storied treasure ships in history. Is one for one of his films, wrote a book about it, Search for Sunken Treasure, and it was in the the Silver Bank, north of the Dominican Republic. We went back there too. So, you know, people think about the conservation side of my grandfather. But he was a big kid at heart too. And he, if there was a mystery, he wanted to answer it. He wanted to investigate it. And um, and that's what's so fun about this show is that we all kind of get to, to play out our inner Goonie. And um, and go exploring these beautiful places, these incredible stories that most people have never heard of, with just crazy characters, diving, danger, you name it. And it's just been a, a lot of fun for Ashlyn and I to do it together. And you know, again, the show is Caribbean Pirate Treasure. It airs Sunday on Travel Channel. The thing that makes sense that I didn't really think through, but boy, when I see it in the show, it makes total sense, is that these efforts are expensive, like on an ongoing basis. Like you guys are kind of there and documenting what's going on, getting into the adventure and the mystery for the time you're there. But these guys who are involved in treasure hunting, who we meet on your show, they make a life's work of this to a degree. They really know where everything is and what part they've searched. And But that's expensive. And it turns out there are a couple of big guys who are like underwrite it. Yeah, I think that like, for instance, Mel Fisher, uh, he's a very famous and successful treasure finder. I won't even call him a treasure hunter. He was a treasure finder. <laughs> he uncovered the Atosha and it was one of the, it, it is the largest haul of treasure ever uncovered. It was $450 million, or at least that's what they reported. There might've been more. <laughs> uh, $450 million, Crazy. gold, silver, bronze, emerald, diamonds. I mean, it was off of, Florida. Yeah, off Cuba. And he spent decades searching for it. Um, and if you're right, for some of these, there you know there are I would say like more amateur or weekend treasure hunters that kind of go out with their metal detectors on the weekends. But then there are these guys that go to the museum, the, the the maritime museum in Britain, and follow these ships and try to you know triangulate the last place the ship was and when it went down and what it was carrying and then they go after investors and they go after these you know investors with big money to support their um their efforts and if they find something then the investors get paid off and if they don't they don't um i mean it's 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 a crazy 
subculture that exists. Boy, if you made that discovery over four hundred million dollars, that'd oh be like God. that's like the lottery that you don't want to tell any relatives about. You don't want to tell anybody. Yeah. Right. I mean, you got to yeah. haul that. You got to haul that stuff up, and then you have to tell everyone now. Everybody, keep quiet about right. this. Right. Exactly. It's, hard, it's hard to don't fence doubloons, though. So. <laughs> Yeah, right. Turning that into money What's is probably the exchange gonna... rate on a pieces of eight. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I know. Depending on what shape it's in, they could be worth a few grand a piece. So if you find one of the, I think one of the treasures we were with, it was like, um, was it 70 pounds of silver or something crazy? And they thought if it wasn't pieces of eight, it would be worth, I mean, just millions of dollars. Uh, you, don't, you realize you don't need to pull up much. It's not like, you know, you just yeah. need some uh, stuff. Exactly. Um, exactly. Well, it's a really cool show, and it's a really cool adventure, and I recommend the show to everyone. It's on Travel Channel Sunday nights. It's called Caribbean Pirate Treasure. You know, again, this world that you're in. What's the name of the conservation society that you you head up, Philippe? Earth Echo International. Okay, and that's at earthecho.org. We'll have a click-through on our website, edge-show.com, and we'll have a click-through to the Travel Channel website so you can learn more about the episodes and learn more about... Philippe and Ashlyn as they go into these dives, which are really thrilling. I mean, it's really a, and it's a well-documented, pretty show to watch. You know, it's like you, you really get into the adventure. I think it's really well done. Thank well, you. we appreciate that, Mark. Thank you. May all your treasure that sunk can now be rising to the surface soon, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, we Philippe. Ashlyn. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Mark. Okay. Bye, Jay Elvis? Yes. I'm like, not necessarily the big scuba adventurer. Like, I might wait on the boat and watch the stuff while the other guys are down there looking for the treasure. All right. Well, everyone has their role yeah. the, on the team. Could you see yourself down there, like, sifting through the sand? Um, It doesn't scare me to think of being down there sifting through the sand, but it doesn't entice me to right. head to the sea, really. It doesn't scare me. It just seems like, yeah, I got to put that outfit on and everything, go down there yeah. and sift through. The, I'm it's just... a bunch of Michigas, <laughs> as my people would say. But really, this is a cool show, and I do think it's an adventure. It's fun to watch other people do it, you know? I did watch it, and, and, and there are more episodes coming. The thing about their show is that you realize that uh, this is a whole world. I mean, this treasure hunting world, right. as I was saying, and that's kind of cool to learn about, you, you know? You know, sort of the backstory on the treasure and why they think it's there and who left it there and why they left it there. That's all sort of interesting stuff. No, it's always cool to see the different nerds of the world, you know. Just even like like HBO Real Sex with sex nerds, you know. It's yeah. like find your subculture and, and see how deep it goes. You know, I love James Bond and the James Bond movies. And there was a James Bond movie moment. Maybe there were several of them, but there was this was the moment. And I kind of was hinting at it in the conversation, and that is when they find this secret society of people who are going for the treasure, right. there's the one guy, right, the top guy. You sure. know, it's sort of like, Mr. Bond, you've discovered my plan to right. uncover the treasures lost thousands of years ago. As you see behind this hidden wall, <laughs> I have the seven greatest treasures of man's history. <laughs> exactly. I need number eight. Number eight lies below the Antarctic. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> well, you know, that's a protected area. You could destroy the entire planet if you were to throw that ecosystem off. Mr. Bond, that I is not... I probably shouldn't have told you all this. <laughs> so there is that moment. And that guy who they meet, who's like the super treasure sponsor, if you will. Yeah. The, 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 the super treasure hunter sponsor. Andropolis he, Papadopoulos. <laughs> he, knows, he knows everything yeah. about, you know, the whole history. Really, really cool. So um, anyway, again, the show is Ashlyn and Philippe Cousteau's show on, on Travel Channel, and it's called Caribbean Pirate Treasure. It's the global deep sea dive and adventure. For treasure Arr. beneath the ocean floor. Sundays on Travel Channel. <laughs> Sundays on Travel Channel beneath the ocean floor. Sundays on Travel Channel. Exactly. Sundays on this channel. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. Let me do this, Josh. Okay. Uh, thanks, Josh, for being here always. And congratulations on the success of your podcast, which is called Thought Spiral. It is indeed. Thank and you. And you do it with Andy Kindler. And I subscribe and I encourage others to. Thank you. Nice of you to say. I mean, if you have to choose between that one and this one, then I think you got to go with this one. But you don't have to choose. You don't have to choose. You can subscribe to both. Right. You could download them both and listen to Thought Spiral. <laughs> Bye, Josh. Bye. 
Thank you for joining us this week. There's a great jumbo episode of The Edge coming this next week. I know I hate to tease an episode ahead, but I just, I can't resist. It's a jumbo episode. So until next time, bye. Oh, okay. Let me, do, okay. Yeah. Let me just, yeah. It's just something. There we go. Yeah. 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 I want to thank you for all the ways that you support my friends on The Edge podcast. And if you haven't already, why don't you show your support and subscribe? What's the matter with you? Go to Edge Show. Oh, shit, it's Edge Dash. What the, what's with the dash, stupid? All right, let me... I want to thank you for all the ways that you support my friends on the Edge podcast. To show your support and leave something on their website, edge-show.com. Stupid. Why is there a dash? edge-show.com. Edge-show.com. Hey, everybody. Why don't you do me a favor and like the ads with Mark Thompson on Facebook? Yeah. That's going to bring in the kids.